And without further ado, I do want to introduce to you Dr. Janet Wright. Uh, we are thrilled, uh, that's putting it mildly, uh, to have her here and to uh, that she took the time out of her schedule uh, to join us. Dr. Wright is the executive director of the Million Hearts Campaign. She practiced cardiology for 23 years and participated in a number of quality improvement and performance improvement programs through work as a volunteer and later a staff member of the American College of Cardiology. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Janet Wright. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad and Joe. I don't know if Joe's still in the room up there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, uh, it is just a delight for me to be here. Not only do I get to talk about my favorite subject, but I get to come back home. I'm a native Arkansan, and I was afraid to leak that news for fear that somebody might change their mind, that they would want somebody from the outside world, not from Arkansas, to come. So uh, I am thrilled. Uh, I grew up in a little town uh, called Earl, uh, about 3,200 people. I love this. This is so wonderful. And I, I want you to know, on Easter Sunday, I was having uh, Easter supper with uh, a bunch of new friends. I've only lived in Washington, well, I guess a couple of years now. but um, And uh, somehow it turned out that of the 30 of us that were in this uh, group, there were five of us from Arkansas. And three of them had gotten stranded in Earl in some sort of storm before. So I felt like I had found my, my, new, uh, my new neighborhood, so to speak. So let's talk about Million Hearts. First of all, has anyone heard of Million Hearts? Yeah, all right, all right, of course. Um, fantastic. I, I don't want to bore you, um, but I also don't want to skip any details. So I'm going to try to read your faces. If I see you getting bored, I'll probably go faster. Um, if I say anything along the way that uh, you have a question about, just raise your hands and, uh, or speak out, and, and we'll cover those as we go along. All right. So. Um, it seems fair <laughs> that I start with the end in mind that I'm going to circle back to these questions. Um, I hope you'll have other questions, but I want to know what about this work excites you, where our work connects uh, in a really meaningful way and in a near-term way, not over the long term, but in this next week. What can we each, we each do differently uh, so that our work connects? Um, and then what can Million Hearts do for you? and I certainly am interested in your advice uh, for us. All right, so Million Hearts, national initiative. It's co-led by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Why would the national government come together, the federal government come together um, over a, a specific condition? Um, and it's pretty clear why it would be cardiovascular disease. You know, it's the uh, number one killer of both genders and races, all races. As it turns out, it's one out of every three deaths, two million heart attacks and strokes a year. It's very, co oh, goodness, excuse me, uh, very costly, not only because it leaves big chunks in our families and in our communities, but it also is um, a cause of major expense, uh, both in lost productivity and in the treatment costs thing that's so annoying about this is that we know what works to control or prevent cardiovascular disease, most types of cardiovascular disease, but we're not getting it applied across the board, across the population. That last bullet is also uh, very important. As it turns out, African Americans, for example, lose 14 months of life expectancy to cardiovascular disease. That's more than twice the number of months lost compared to other conditions. Another reason, so, so we've got the number one killer, we've got known evidence and science on what to do, um, a very expensive problem for the country, and the next thing is that knowing what to do doesn't necessarily mean that it gets done across the board. So here you've got the ABCs, so aspirin for those who need it or those at risk for cardiovascular events, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. And you can see at, across the population, we're not getting to 50% performance on any of these very straightforward and pretty darn simple things. I mean, simple in terms of knowing what to do. 
the thing that bothers me probably the most on this slide is that the denominator on the smoking cessation statistic are those who've already decided to quit smoking. So these are people who've already come that far and only 23% of them are being offered the counseling or the medications that have been shown to help quitters stay quit. So we got room for improvement and that's why the federal government has come together with private sector partners an enormous number of private sector partners to attack this beast. I didn't mention it, but a uh, million hearts has a very specific goal, and that is to prevent a million heart attacks and strokes in five years. The clock started ticking January 1 of 2012. It's going to keep ticking until January 1 of 2017. So um, these are... Factors that affect health, and I just want to make a point that uh, Million Hearts is not hitting all of those places on the pyramid. W Million Hearts is not focused at all on the socioeconomic factors, but when those are addressed, you have a much greater impact on health. But going up the pyramid, Million Hearts does have activity in the changing the context, and that is specifically in looking for um, improvements in smoke-free uh, workplaces, smoke-free policies, uh, tobacco taxes, and getting rid or r lowering the salt in the food as well as eliminating the trans fats. Million Hearts and all of you are working a, a little bit higher up on the pyramid with smoking cessation treatment. Uh, those of you who are in clinical practice know that when you advise your patients to stop smoking, they actually, you give them a leg up. It's enormously powerful, your influence. And then higher up, where I spent as a cardiologist a whole lot of my time, I was disappointed to find out I was so high up on the pyramid, by the way, but um, treating high blood pressure and high cholesterol has a huge impact, um, but it does get a little bit less of an impact the higher up we go. And that's why Million Hearts is bringing together both community and clinical efforts. And here's where we'll talk about those. So <clears throat> I practiced cardiology for, uh, as Chad said, 23 years. When I uh, was hired, I was hired by the CDC. And to me, the CDC was uh, salmonella outbreaks and global health issues. I had no contact with the CDC. So when I had my first visit uh, to Atlanta to get immersed with my new team members, even though I work out of the Innovation Center in Baltimore. Someone in the public health, uh, one of the groups that I met said, Janet, you know, what, what was your contact with your public health department in all those years practicing in Northern California? I said, you know, I think I went there once for a TB test to be read. I, I had no contact with my public health department. And now I'm, I'm just embarrassed that I could practice that long and be in such a cocoon, be so separate. So uh, I am learning, and I now have come to deeply appreciate all the contributions of public health, and I believe that Million Hearts, as many people have predicted, will be one framework that helps integrate those it, toward a common goal, making wise use of limited resources. So on the community side, I'm going to quickly go over for you the efforts to reduce exposure to smoke and tobacco, reduce salt in the foods, eliminate trans fats, and then I'll dwell on the clinical side where, again, as a practicing doc, I, I'm a lot more comfortable over here, but I'll tell you I'm absorbing this pretty fast and admiring it more every day. All right, on the tobacco side, these are the things that have been shown to work, the comprehensive programs, the ones that include the mass media campaign. I don't know if any of you have seen the recently launched CDC wicked commercials showing people who are suffering from the ravages of tobacco. Yeah, it's quite graphic, um, but pursuing uh, smoke-free uh, public places and workplace policies, as well as the availability of uh, low-cost counseling and medications. So I'll show you an example where this, so this is not uh, fantasy land we're talking about. These are examples that come from New York State and New York City. So going from a fairly short period of time, from 2002 to, two th to 2010, you see that the taxes on a pack of cigarettes doubled over that period of time. And if you just keep in mind the slope of that slide, when you look at this slide, and see the decline in smokers over the same period, 2002 to 2010. Now, it wasn't just the increase in uh, 
taxes during that time. They also launched the, the mass media campaigns. Uh, free patch programs were intermittent during that time, as well as uh, some changes in policy. I could show a slide that parallels this one, showing uh, smokers under the age of 18. That looks just the same, drops like a rock. So it can be done. On sodium, uh, as you all know, about 90% of us take in more sodium than we need. It takes about 5 to 12 days, apparently, to drop, uh, to have our taste buds change uh, its um, preference for sodium. So if we just wean ourselves off over a 5 to 12 day period, you actually end up uh, preferring the lower sodium. <coughs> but getting that uh, getting the sodium out into the processed foods and our restaurant available foods, which is where we get most of our sodium, is the challenge. I've met a number of times with the food industry. Um, a lot of the work on sodium is going on with the FDA and the CDC and the food industry. And the food uh, manufacturers basically say, you know, we'll make any amount of sodium. We don't care. We just want to sell the product. So those of us who buy the foods have to create a market for the lower sodium uh, before they will stock the shelves. Uh, moving on, I'll tell you I practiced a long time without knowing that trans fats were even in the food, much less were a bad actor, but they are. Uh, the trans fats lower the good cholesterol and raise the bad cholesterol. Replacing it in the food is feasible, doesn't change the taste, doesn't change the texture or the cost. And the work at Million Hearts is, again, working with the food industry to eliminate those trans fats. This is just a quick map around the country. The gray zone is where there's nothing going on right now in trans fat regulations uh, with food service establishments. Uh, the orange uh, where there's activity, some of it is not good. Um, and then the purplish color is where uh, trans fat uh, regulations have been passed. So there's a lot of gray area left in the country for more work. So we'll switch over to the clinical side now. And one of the things about Million Hearts is, um, is that it is a very focused initiative. Uh, Million Hearts uh, is, came out of the brain of uh, Tom Frieden at CDC, who is very focused, um, and also Don Berwick at CMS, who requires that specificity of a timeline and a goal. So on the clinical side, um, we're working to make sure that the ABCs are excellent, that uh, HIT is used to facilitate that excellence, and that we take advantage of all the innovations that are coming out uh, in care delivery now. You all are well aware of CMS, I, but because uh, this crazy beast is uh, led by both or co-led by both organizations, I never want to miss saying largest purchaser of health care in the world. The statistic here that still blows me away is that they reply to over 75 million questions each year at CMS and they pay more than a billion and a half dollars in benefits every day. So some changes are coming about, and I think you all are, I know you are well aware of these, but we will be facing a very different healthcare system in uh, 2015, by 2015. First of all, we're gonna be reporting publicly, not just on quality, but also on resource use, mandated, <coughs> excuse me, the state exchanges will be up and running and covering another 10 or 12 million people. Medicaid will be getting in 22 million new patients uh, covering and, uh, covered by Medicaid. Um, I was just talking to David, I think, uh, before this started, is how do, what, how do we handle that? How do we staff up? Um, HIT will be more uh, uh, adopted in a more widespread fashion. I did hear from uh, Paul Halverson, Halverson that he thinks 60% of Arkansas practitioners are on EHRs. Does that sound right to you? 60%? That is so cool. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what the numbers are per state, but 60% sounds very high to me. And I came from a practice in California with no electronic medical record. I used to say we had an abacus to keep our medical charts. We, it was ancient, but they got one after I left, by the way. Uh, bundling programs will be up and running by then, and the new models in place. So I bet that most of you are familiar with a chart like this, 
but it reminds me that uh, years across the top, by 2015, um, those who have not participated in PQRS, not been e-prescribers, not uh, using EHRs meaningfully, and not participating in maintenance of certification are in the hole in terms of their reimbursement down by uh, as far as up to 2.5%. Uh, uh, so 2015 is a big year. The also... Um, ahead of us is the value-based modifier, which means that CMS is mandated to pay differentially on the basis of quality and efficiency of care. <coughs> Excuse me. That modifier is going to be applied to um, high-cost services in 2017 and applies to all physicians by 2017, so that those uh, practitioners who are more efficient and higher quality will actually be paid more, and those who are less will be paid less. This is a very different system than we have uh, known in the past. Okay, so out of that, Million Hearts is dead set on creating a uniform set of the ABCs. Those of you who practice know that there are 12 different measures for blood pressure and 14 for cholesterol. They're not the same. They're not collected the same way. We don't send them off to various uh, reporting places uh, the same way. So our work there is to make that uniform set so that it is simple. Ideally, that measure set should be extracted during the flow of care, so it's not something that you do late at night with a stack of charts. And that um, ideally, again, high performance on the ABCs is linked to incentives and, and reward wherever possible. So I show you this. Um, it's a busy chart, but it, all I really want you to focus on is how much empty space there is. This is a set of measures for the ABCs along the column here on the left with the number of the measure. And then well, if the measure was present, is present in the meaningful use of electronic medical records system. The following is PQRS measure set, and the next one is accountable care organizations. And then with HRSA in the uniform data system, and then NQF measures. So this is where we started in the alignment process, and this is where we are now. <clears throat> My point is that we've been able to create that uniform data set so that if for the accountable care organizations, for example, of the 33 measures they're required to report on, the Million Hearts measures are there. PQRS has a prevention measure group, as you know, um, and those are specifically uh, and exactly aligned with the Million Hearts measures. Same thing with meaningful use. So progress is being made. I don't have to tell this crowd what uh, the benefits of HIT are. Um, I think one of the things that we plan to explore are the, or make progress in, not explore, is actually make progress in two areas. One is the clinical decision support, so that when you're seeing a patient, that EHR helps you recognize whatever opportunities are present during that encounter to make the most of that encounter. Is it time to up titrate a blood pressure medicine because it's the third visit since the blood pressure's been uh, a little high? The other area of focus is the reminders for those of us who take medicine or perhaps need a reminder to go out and take a walk or to do something else healthy to reinforce a healthy habit. So how can we use HIT in a more effective way uh, to improve medication adherence, for example? So the care deliveries, uh, the care delivery models that are now being launched include health homes and Medicaid, the patient-centered medical home, where I know there are a number already in the state accountable care organizations and the bundled payments. Our work behind the scenes is to make sure the ABCs get embedded in all of those new models and that incentives are attached to those and that we are funding team members that are very effective change agents. So what can we do to help pharmacists realize their potential as the professionals that they are? Um, cardiac rehab teams, classically underutilized, and then what's the role for health coaches and lay workers and the peer wellness specialists that are now improving care uh, in mental health? So I just want to show a couple of slides of some, it's a subset of the number of programs currently at CMS that will help prevent heart attack and stroke. I sort of magnified the QIOs because I believe the QIOs are the classic, fantastic middle layer 
between providers and policy where uh, you can actually make change and assist uh, folks in their quality improvement uh, in, in the field at the ground level. There are pages and pages of these uh, programs that are occurring at CMS. When we first counted in Million Hearts back in September, there were 47 different activities across the federal family, all helping to prevent heart attack and stroke. So we're working to focus those efforts. These are our public partners. These are all uh, federal family members. <clears throat> and just recently, the uh, EPA signed on as well. They have a lot of uh, activity now, uh, which they call Green Heart. It's actually improving the quality of the air to help prevent heart attack and stroke. This list is uh, a subset, actually. There are new partners every day. We had a little bit of a competition going on between Maryland and New York. Maryland came in first as the first state. And then when New York came in, they said, we don't need to be the first because we're going to be the best. And then before we knew it, uh, Virginia wanted to be the first Commonwealth. So uh, w the important thing here is the diversity and the fact that each of these partners has committed very specific activity towards preventing heart attack and stroke. There's no question that there is room for everyone at this puzzle, and it's going to take everybody to get to an audacious goal. So suspecting that many of you are in the clinical care settings now, um, I, I want to bring this back to a more personal level. One of the questions we get asked about Million Hearts is, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do that's different than what I'm doing? And this is just the clinician standpoint, whether this is nurse, uh, uh, nurse practitioner, uh, physician, uh, PA. Um, one of the things we're asking is that you speak frankly to your patients about risk. Many times I felt I was doing that, but now uh, knowing what I know, uh, which you would have thought I would know about cardiology, I realize that my conversations are more powerful than I imagined. So we're asking each of you to have that conversation and to have it more than once and to have it with the spouses as well as with the individuals that you feel are at risk. This business of games, we've learned from teenagers and others that any time you can engage uh, someone in a quiz, in a competition, in some sort of ability to trend over time, do it. Um, you, you know, often, I don't know if this is true for you all, but my patients who are engineers always brought me back in graphs and charts where they had charted their blood pressures and stuff. So uh, engaging them in a game. Um, just calling out medication adherence as a major issue and making that okay to talk about with your patients is a big deal. And then making sure that all your staff are also addressing that because sometimes they won't tell you, but they'll tell someone else they're having a problem with their medication. Deploying the team members uh, to help uh, with that behavior change. Getting your, your whole staff to work to cajole, uh, reinforce, and to badger when it comes to staying on medicines and uh, adopting those healthy habits. A key point here is measuring, and that's one of the fantastic roles for the QIO, is to help us all learn how to measure our performance and then gradually improve it. The point about uh, if you decide that the ABCs are not really, your, not really something that you need to handle, Make sure you hand it off to someone on your team, some partner or someone in your community who will handle that. And then we want you to share with us what's working and what's not. So on the state basis, I thought I'd give you a little run through of what's happening now. Obviously, the QIOs are hard at work on the aims uh, of for a million hearts. There are 42 heart disease and stroke prevention programs across the country, 61 uh, community transformation grantees, the RECs, as you all are here uh, at AFMC, and the Beacons. We're also learning of some spontaneous activity that we didn't know about. One of them is a QIO in Nebraska uh, got together with the Heart Disease and Stroke Program there to create an ABC's advisory group. They're meeting on a regular basis and problem solving together. And then, as I mentioned, both Maryland and New York State have pulled their public health and clinical practice communities together around the goal. This is what we're seeing. It's kind of a messy slide, but we're seeing this form uh, through state activities. There's different leadership in every state. 
but they are coming together uh, with those streams, as I mentioned, QIOs and beacons and RECs, heart disease and stroke programs, um, and building this network through which uh, knowledge can be distributed and uh, likewise uh, knowledge and lessons uh, learned. This again is a pretty busy slide, but it shows some, un it, it depicts uh, what we have discovered as uh, kind of unexpected benefits of this initiative. And that is that the um, state medical pharmacy and nursing associations are coming together. The students have taken on Million Hearts like nobody's business, um, screening in their communities, but also connecting uh, with each other in interdisciplinary care uh, modules. And then uh, the patient and uh, advocacy groups have taken on to Million Hearts. We are yet to get good purchase with the uh, employers, uh, but the insurers are paying attention and beginning to uh, work with us to look at new ways to get medications uh, at no copay or very low copay, um, and then beginning to build some corporate partnerships. So here's where we're headed. Right now, uh, you've seen the baseline performance level. That target of 65% is where we want to be by January of 2017. The clinical target are for those individuals who are in clinical care already, thinking that that should be a higher target, a more ambitious goal. That is an audacious change in a very short period of time, and it will take everyone to get there. So I'll have to give you a quick uh, idea of where we're headed uh, as of May. May kicks off our focus on high blood pressure. Um, we've chosen that as a focal point for the first year or two, and here's why. Uh, we've got about 66 million Americans actually with high blood pressure, and 37 million of those are not under control. There's a scary statistic here is that in this particular, with this survey uh, tool, um, there's the ability to record blood pressures over time. And so these folks, uh, the 14 million who are unaware, have multiple measurements showing high blood pressure. And yet when you ask them, they don't know that they have high blood pressure. That's a, a huge number of people at risk. And then the other large number are those 17 million that are treated but not yet controlled. We know that a small reduction in the top blood pressure number, the systolic, can have a major impact on stroke and uh, heart disease rates. So five millimeters of a drop can drop the total uh, mortality by 7%. So there are a number of other activities going on here in May, uh, but these are all kicking off uh, activity that will be pursued. One of the things that has kind of captured the imagination of a number of our partners is the idea of a sprint. So we're asking a number of them from May 1st to August 1st to do something around blood pressure control. Not just screening, which is good, but actually trying to get people under control in a 90-day period. There's something about a 90-day sprint that is refreshing. People can feel like they can kind of get their heads around 90 days. It's like me with a 5K, I think. I could probably do that because I can walk part of that. Um, so 90 days, what can you do? What we expect is that by September, we'll have some reports of some fierce competitions around blood pressure control and some success stories to share. In September, uh, there'll be a program that's launched called Team Up Pressure Down with initial focus on pharmacists. This is an initiative to um, inform the public of the role of the pharmacist and uh, to um, really shine a light on those areas like Arkansas where pharmacists can actually titrate medications, trying to find out uh, what is the most effective model for the population to get that blood pressure under control. So here's the future state. Lower sodium foods, they're everywhere. We actually prefer them. Uh, they're inexpensive. You can't even find anything that's really salty anymore. Secondly, blood pressure monitoring starts at home. After all, it's my blood pressure, so I ought to control it. I'll use my doctor or my nurse as a consultant or a coach to help me. But, but I know what I need to do, and I know when I need to call for help. Data flows seamlessly from my blood pressure cuff at home to the healthcare professional that I choose to engage in my care. And that advice that I need is, is available whether it's Sunday afternoon or Christmas Day, and I get it from the 
person or the persons that seem to help me the most. The no or low copays are for medications. The reason that's there, of course, is that these meds help me prevent a heart attack and stroke, which is really expensive. So it would be silly to make me pay for medicine that, that actually helped keep me healthy. And then high performance on blood pressure control is actually rewarded. That's shifting to the outcome-based reimbursement system. This too is not fantasy. As it turns out, there are good studies that show that if you add a web-based pharmacist care to home monitoring, you can actually achieve blood pressure control and in people that need it the most. These are all folks with systolics above 160. So this slide is a reminder for me to tell you, to warn you, that I show this slide almost every day giving talks, as do my colleagues who are giving talks. And you see number two here is what we're asking people to do is to contact their QIO. So if you're getting any traffic uh, or any increase in traffic, I don't know if it's because we're preaching this, but we believe that every partner should sign the pledge and should start contacting the leaders in the state who can help improve the quality of the cardiovascular care in that state. We're also asking for approaches because we feel that one of the things we can do is gather the approaches that are working effectively in other areas of the country and spread those around to um, more rapidly um, uh, allow everybody else to adopt it. No reason you have to invent everything yourself. Um, and then uh, we want to know uh, how those folks can help us. All right, so this was as of March 12th, uh, the number of pledges. I have to tell you, when I first learned that we were collecting pledges, it was hard for me to ask people to pledge because I wasn't sure what that meant. Um, I have come to understand that the pledging uh, for an individual or an organization on our website is a personal commitment. We are fortunate with Million Hearts to have the, the support of the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sibelius. It's one of her priorities. But if this initiative does not catch fire in the hearts of each of us because we have been touched by heart disease in one way or another, then we're not going to get the goal. It will not make the difference that it needs to make. So I do now ask people to go to the website and pledge. If you see back in March, Arkansas was hitting uh, in that 28 to 72 number of pledges with no cities listed. So I got them to update the map and it looked like things got worse, but it, it didn't. The scale changed. Um, but you see, my home state is not looking great here on a pledge site. I meant to bring in my laptop, so maybe you could pledge while we were here all together. But uh, there is a place, if you go to the website, there is a place to pledge as an individual or an organization. We are counting, and the secretary is counting as well. Uh, it helps us know that we are beginning to engage people in this good work. You guys are up to your neck in good work. So I would ask you, uh, consider taking the pledge. Um, help me understand what you're doing and help me spread what you're doing around to others uh, who can benefit from your experience. So I will end where we began. Um, I'm happy to really happy to take answers to these questions, but I'm also uh, delighted to ask uh, or try to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you. <coughs> yes. I saw on your slide that you said they need to contact the heart disease and stroke prevention program and the yes. chronic disease director. My name is Nongar Zuhuri. I am the chronic disease yes. director for Arkansas. And I wanted to, to announce and just let everybody know that the chronic disease coordinating council for, for Arkansas, which is that. Thank you. We, no, we have to get closer together. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, that we have actually in Arkansas just two weeks ago at the retreat that we had of all of our chronic disease programs and coalitions and partners have adopted the Million Hearts goals as our focused goal for the next five years for Arkansas as part of our chronic disease state plan. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. And if any of you have not yet heard, we have a chronic disease uh, conference coming up on May 4th, and that's, that's the meeting at which this will be announced and, and launched. So thank you very much for this.
Any other questions for Dr. Wright? You have such an epidemic of obesity in this country, and I didn't see that embedded in ABC. Right. I know John Berwick, how he's done that for quite a bit just prior to coming to see him, and I assume now that he's no longer there. He likes those kinds of numbers of a million lives. Right. Why obesity is highlighted or specified? I'm so glad you asked that question. So I'm assuming everybody could hear, why isn't obesity, with the epidemic that we have, why isn't obesity there? I'll tell you, I had a similar question. When I first heard about Million Hearts, I was on the staff at the ACC and thought my role would be understanding how the American College of Cardiology could play a role in Million Hearts. But I would lie awake at night, and I could not believe that the A was aspirin. I thought the A should be activity. Or um, A1C. I mean, I just really aspirin. So I sat with the science team at CDC for some time, and they finally got it through my head that in a five-year time period, the statistics do the modeling uh, uh, supports aspirin, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, it did, and smoking. It doesn't mean that, of course, that uh, weight control is not very important. Um, and then when you think about it, what kills diabetics is cardiovascular disease. If we are controlling the ABCs, fortunately, uh, mortality to diabetics will be reduced. But with obesity, part of the problem is there was no fix. There was no easy approach. There was no straightforward way to get that done. And then great concern that we couldn't get it done in five years. So uh, uh, it's... Still, and I'm still activity. No activity. We just so what? I have people come off of a pressure medicine and they're better control medicine by losing weight. Right. 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 I completely agree. Well, in fact, one of the one of the things I I have said is to build out the alphabet to get excellent in the ABCs because the science is good around the ABCs, and then build out the alphabet: D for diabetes, E for exercise, W for weight management.